Voss, as you know, I was uh, trained in science and neuroscience. I've had a very uh, lifelong interest on the possibility that God exists and what such a being would be like. And I've watched the science-religion debates uh, over the decades. Uh, and I, I, I've seen scientists and people who are believers in, in, uh, in various discussions, sometimes uh, uh, pleasant, sometimes rancorous. Um, question I want to ask is, what's the role of philosophy? And you're a philosophy mm. of science, you're a believer. Mm. Uh, what can philosophy, uh, how can it help this dialogue between science and, and theology? Mm. Well, I think that the answer is the same for theology and for science, how, how philosophy can help, and it's a very modest answer. Um, make straight the way of the Lord, um, as uh, John the Baptist <laughs> says, right? Um, what I mean is to remove obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, and both in the case of uh, religion and, and science, we see many, many bad arguments that are hindrances to both. Um, in the case of science, we have the science skeptics and climate deniers, and they use bad arguments. They are convinced by bad arguments. Uh, philosophers can step into the discussion and clarify and uh, show up the fallacies. Now, on the other side, too, um, the new atheists, for example, um, they have arguments against uh, uh, the very possibility of a rational a person believing, <laughs> being a believer. And again, uh, a philosopher can step in and uh, confront these arguments. Now, Gary Gutting here at the University of Notre Dame, uh, he wrote um, a, a column in the New York Times, The Stone, uh, yeah, column, yeah. and he mentioned that uh, Dawkins has some very bad arguments. Immediately, there was an enormous response by readers saying that he was wrong. And so he wrote another column to show just what the bad arguments were. Yeah. Now, I think that is a service to uh, religion in this case. It's only when we can remove obstacles that there's going to be a possibility of actually bringing a contact between science and uh, theology. And that means that science should be cl clarified and it should be cleared of scientism. And, uh, scientism being the worship of science. The worship, the right. And the, and the idea that that is all there is. And that the only way to access any kind of truth is through science. Exactly. This kind of limiting uh, role of science. And in the case of theology, uh, again, the, there are obstacles that make it very difficult for religious people often mm. to accept mm. certain uh, things that come out in science. Um, but uh, if a philosopher can do his work there, he can remove the barriers. Now, you are uh, famously and well-deserved uh, rec recognized as one of the great philosophers of, of science and particularly having made um, um, uh, um, legitimate an anti-realist position for science, which mm. had fallen into, into some somewhat disregard until you came along to show show this. And now, not that everybody believes what you say, but mm. it's a very important and legitimate position to understand deeply what science mm. is mm -hmm. by your anti-realist position. Yes. And people admire you for that. Uh, and then some people are surprised when they find out that mm. another part of your life, you, you believe in God. Mm. Um, which seems to indicate a, a, a realism approach to, to religion mm. or theology mm. because if God is unobservable and your mm. claim in science, mm. anti-realist, is that you can never see the unobservable in mm. science. You mm. can only see the empirical data that you, that you can get. You can never get to that unobservable in the thing in itself. Yes. But if you believe in God, you have to believe that you could get to the thing in itself, which is God. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I asked the same question of Michael Dummett, uh, the Oxford philosopher who was an Orthodox Catholic and, and a much more extreme anti-realist than I will ever be. Okay. And he said, well, there's lots of unsolved problems in philosophy. <laughs> but no, I want, to, I want to do better than that. Mm. Um, so, um, you see, I don't understand faith as a as involving a quasi-scientific hypothesis about an architect of the universe. Um, I see uh, faith uh, in, a, in a different way. Um, and uh, you perhaps know this book by Arthur Danto about art called The Transfiguration of the Commonplace. Well, I think that's a good phrase to use for faith. Uh, in faith, we have a transfiguration of the commonplace. 
Mm. Uh, we see the world differently. Now, um, I don't for a moment, I'm not at all deny, it's not like I, I don't agree. I mean, um, God exists. God is real. God is real in, in, in our experience, in life, in the world. There's no question about that for me. But it is not at all anything like belief in an unobservable uh, object in physical nature. And so I, I, I'd like more distinguishing between the two because, mm -hmm. because if we're dealing with uh, you know, particle physics, if we're dealing mm -hmm. with molecular biology, mm -hmm. I mean, your argument, and a very strong one, a very powerful one, even though many people don't agree with it, but everybody recognizes that it is legitimate and needs to be taken seriously, is that you can never know what that that the, 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 the unobservable really, really is. You know what it, it produces, but you don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But to worship a god, you have to believe that you really know what that is. I mean, you don't have to know every characteristic. Well, I think you're overstating it a bit. Um, um, That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, in the end, uh, there are the mysteries of faith. Okay. And uh, the idea of understanding God, it's much more common for an atheist to think that he knows what God is than for a believer. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, expand uh, that a little bit. Well, you see, the atheist says uh, God is uh, this, and that, and the other, and because of that, he doesn't exist because something like that could not exist. Right, right. Right? Well, typically, though, he's putting words in the mouth of the believer, um, or he's taking uh, uh, a text from the liturgy and saying, oh, I take this literally. Uh, I'm a fundamentalist. I'm, I'm an atheist, but I'm a fundamentalist because I take this literally, right? And then he comes across religious people uh, who just don't think that way and who say, you know, when Laplace said uh, to, to Napoleon, I have no need of this hypothesis, we agree. There is not n any need for another hypothesis to add to science in order to understand the natural world. That, that addition being God. Yeah. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and so, wh wh where does that uh, where does that get you in terms of in terms of your own internal coherence mm. about uh, uh, anti-realism in science mm. and this some kind of realism mm. in uh, in your approach to faith? Yeah. So what what I think about in that case is uh, experience, uh, the experience of finding yourself in a sacred place, um, the experience of somehow a personal encounter um, that is afterward is not uh, something easy to describe and if you describe just you know feelings and such then the psychologist will go and say oh i can study that right um, but it's it's the meaning uh, that that escapes the psychologist in that case and uh, this is what makes it real for me okay uh, faith is not a matter of inference from data to experience, to, uh, to hypotheses. It's not that. 